School is back for the semester, campus activism is back on the go, and that means that I am joined by a good friend and colleague, Blaise Elaine, the man who spent so much of his life at the University of Toronto, so many good years of his life at the University of Toronto as a student, and now even more years as a camp campus activist. Stay tuned for our conversation about some tools to have in your back pocket when it comes to campus activism. Hi, folks, and welcome to the Pro-Life Guys podcast. My name is Cam. I am your host, and this is a show dedicated to equipping you with the tools that you need to have compassionate and compelling conversations about abortion so that you and I and all those in the audience in this growing pro-life movement can change minds, save lives, and transform culture. I am honored and humbled by your uh, participation in the show by being one of our wonderful um, guests and, and audience members. I thank you wherever you're tuning in from, whether it's a podcast or whether it's on YouTube, whether it's the website. Um, as I keep mentioning over and over again, I appreciate you bearing with me um, on on the episodes that are coming out now. Um, my, you can see behind me the nursing chair that my wife is using for my one week old um, son and and all the craziness with adding a second child. It's been wonderful, beautiful, all that sort of thing. My two and a half year old daughter, Eleanor, is loving our son, Matthew, um, but it's a difficult transition, as I'm sure most parents can can identify with. And so appreciate you bearing with me as we keep pumping out this content that I hope is helping you in um, your conversations about abortion. These last couple of weeks, we've been talking a little bit about the roadmap for conversations and areas that people can sometimes get off track. Um, today, I'm really excited for a conversation that I'm going to have with Blaze Elaine, friend and colleague. He is the Eastern Outreach Court, um, Director for CCBR, the parent organization for the Pro-Life Guys podcast. Um, we're a national pro-life educational group proactively engages Canadians in um, compassionate, compelling conversations about abortion while also visually exposing the real um, tragedy, the human rights violation that abortion is showing the victims of this atrocity to anchor conversations with considerations of the humanity of preborn children. Taking this from an abstract concept to a concrete individual victim um, is our target. And I'm really excited. Blaze has a tremendous wealth of wisdom and knowledge when it comes to campus engagement. And I, I can't wait to dive into the conversation with him. So without further ado, Blaze Elaine, Eastern Outreach Director, Canadian Centre for Bioethical Reform. All right, Blaze Elaine, thanks a ton for joining again. What is new in the world of Blaze Elaine right now? Oh, wow. Well, I uh, regrew my beard and maybe a combination of that and uh, returning to the podcast. Like, can I be a pro-life guy soon? Oh, <laughs> I've man. got the beard. I'm, I've been on a few podcast episodes now. Maybe maybe I can be the new Cam one day or, or join you. <laughs> oh, that, you're, you are tempting there, Blaze. I would love to get you on as a, a co-host. We're going to leave that discussion for the, the coming. I love the goatee, but I got to admit, <laughs> um, I was just watching, rewatching some community clips. I don't know if you've seen the, the sitcom community. Um, and there's a, the darkest timeline from Abed and Troy where they've got the evil goatee and that, that was the first thing that jumped into my mind when I saw the goatee but it looks great keep rocking it <laughs> I, I think I'm going to shave it off soon in terms of <laughs> campus activism and uh and uh I, I I think I can still pass for a uh for a younger undergrad it wasn't that long since I was in university but my wife's trying to convince me to keep it, so we'll see oh, where it goes. Must be nice to be able to, to pass as a younger undergrad. Every, every passing day, there's more gray hair, and, and I'm sure it's going to start falling out soon for me. And so I, I got a face made for radio now, I feel like. Um, but that, that I, Maybe. I, I don't know if I can pull that off, but I'll, I'll talk to Catherine about that. Um, I digress, though. This is not why we're having you on the show. Um, I would love to dive into some campus stuff with you um, as somebody who not only leads a ton of campus activism, but um, was a campus activist as a student for a very long time. I don't think that you're taking any courses right now, but it wouldn't surprise me if you were. Um, maybe... maybe um, just for a moment, give us a little bit of background as to your campus involvement, because for those of you who might not be very familiar with your journey, um, a lot of your pro-life involvement actually came through campus activism. Is that true? Actually, I know yeah, that's true, yeah, but, but tell me more about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I am not a student at the moment, okay. though um, I will likely return to taking some courses in the coming years. Um, but I spent... Uh, 15 years with University of Toronto Students for Life through my undergrad and then through my master's. And really my background is campus activism. So the first time I ever did any CCBR activism was 
um, what's now called the Abortion Awareness Project. Uh, back in 2006 at U of T, we used to do it once a year at the end of each winter semester. And um, I met the founders of CCBR, Stephanie and Jojo, through uh, training and talks that they were giving on my university campus. And um, I was the technology officer of U of T Students for Life during my undergrad, and then the education coordinator of U of T Students for Life through my master's. So first focused on website and social media, and then focused on training our, our like my club mates and then leading the team in outreach. And the activism team at U of T Students for Life later grew into Toronto Against Abortion, reaching across the city and multiple campuses. I took a couple courses at uh, Ryerson University, now Toronto Metropolitan University. And um, I was the assistant leader for the Ryerson Against Abortion team. And I have worked with other campus leaders um, at York University, at U of T's Mississauga and Scarborough campus. I guess I was the vice president for UTM Students for Life for a year. Um, and I've uh, helped out campus clubs elsewhere in Ontario, like at, at Western and places. So um, my background's really at U of T, but I've also had experience working with other students on other campuses and, and doing campus activism all over the place. Love it. Love it. So what we're going to do, what, what I want to do for those in the audience, I want to break this into two kind of focus displays. And I mentioned this to you before the show. I want to talk, first of all, about something that's going to resonate with everybody, namely being an activist on a university campus or a college campus, whatever it may be. Um, and second of all, we'll talk a little bit about, um, as a student, what campus activism can look like and how we can balance that with our course load, with our other responsibilities, with being a a normal human being and not um, getting burnt out or whatever. But let's dive first into being an activist going onto campus, whether you're a student or whether you're just a, a civilian going onto campuses. Um, I'm curious, first of all, is this something that, so over the summer, you and I, we do a ton of activism in kind of urban settings, where we often call, we, we do it downtown, street corners, that kind of thing, because there aren't as many students on campus. We did a little bit over the summer. It wasn't um, quite as vibrant as it generally is from the September to April kind of semester timeline. Um, first of all, I'm curious, is it something you're looking forward to getting back to, presumably? Or how, in your mind, do you characterize the differences between kind of a downtown activism engagement with passersby and a campus-style engagement with, with students on campus? We're all super excited in Toronto about returning to Toronto Campuses for Activism this September. And we have um, through, uh, through the month. Um, uh, campuses are really great because you end up having a lot longer conversations with people, a lot more in depth. Whereas when you're, um, you know, generally about downtown in a city, um, it can be more of a challenge sometimes to get people uh, to stop or you end up having shorter conversations. People are on their way. They're on a, on a lunch break at work or something like that. Um, whereas generally speaking, it's a lot easier to get people to stop when they're university students on campus. They have a few hours till their next class. And um, it's, it's just really rewarding because you get to really talk through the issue and you don't have conversations cut short. And, um, and because students are, are quite open-minded, my, my, my friend, Rebecca used to say there were three, um, three key reasons why it's important to do university activism and I'll add a fourth. Um, first, you have a lot of students who are at risk from abortion. So it's a critically important mission field. Second, uh, people are often more open-minded in the sense that they're making up their minds about what they think about big topics like this, like they're forming, they're in the middle of forming their worldview. Um, third, you're talking to a lot of the leaders of tomorrow, people who might be in law school or medical school and, you know, have the ability to influence future leaders. And the fourth that I'll add is that um, you can recruit while you're doing outreach. It's the kind of one regular place where the people that you're talking to, your target audience, when you reach pro-lifers, they're also available to join that team. Like you're talking to other students who can become a part of the team. So for all those reasons, we're super excited to go to that like dialogue rich environment of university campuses and the fall months are always great for that. Love it. One thing that I'm going to add as well, and, and this is probably something that most university, university students and college students won't want to admit necessarily, but 
Thankfully, the vast majority of people recognize that there is a responsibility to get back to work on time. And so, like you said, you're, you're kind of working within very particular windows while you're doing um, downtown activism at lunchtime or whatever. You've got people, whether it's um, stoplight to stoplight or whether it's I got to be back to work by one o'clock because that's where my job begins. I love being on campuses because you know that so many of the students, especially after like their first semester on campus, they realize that they're not actually going to lose marks if they're not at many of their classes. And so not, I'm, I'm not encouraging you to skip classes. Don't get me wrong on that. But there are a lot of students that you can be like, you know what? Do you really need to go? Like, like we could probably keep talking about this. We're talking about abortion. This is one of the most important issues of our time. And you're talking about entry-level basket weaving. Like, really? Do you need to go to that class? I like... I might not spend it quite that straight, but I, I definitely appreciate people's willingness, like you said, to engage in this important issue, especially, I, I, I don't know if you've noticed it, the different spots on campus and different kinds of conversations that you get into, but we do a lot of outreach here in Calgary, at the University of Calgary, Mount Royal, and we find that we get a very particular kind of conversation when we're in the math and sciences wings, different than we do when we're in the, the education, the arts faculties, the philosophy wings, and you get a lot of kids. I, I love having the ethics class has come out and they've just learned about some virtue ethics or or this or that or whatever kind of philosophical principle and they want to experiment with it they want to see the the pros and cons and flaws of their whatever they've just learned and so i i think you're bang on in the pros of doing on on campus activism i think it's fantastic i'm curious in your mind do you see any cons doing like is there anything that you're like okay well we have to be aware of this because we've been able to not necessarily get away with this during a, a downtown choice channel are there any cons going back to campus that, that spring to your mind hmm. well just on the class skipping briefly like i'll, I'll echo yeah. that but um it's also like you know in all honesty as you said we're talking about abortion right yeah. and frankly sometimes that conversation might be far more important than a class that someone has Right. Like we've had stories of people who have chosen life because of their interaction with our pro-life activism on campuses. And it's and that kind of like life changing conversation, that life changing decision that can be life or death for their baby and, and you know, change the shape of, of the rest of their lives and, the, and their family. Like that might be more important even than like a critical calculus class. Like we're talking life and death in terms of any cons. Um, I mean, it's hard for me to think of cons because I love campus activism so much and it's such an important place to be and it's so great. Um, I think the one challenge that comes to mind is while students in general are a lot more willing to have the conversation as compared to other places, um, you can also meet um, more regular organized opposition. And in particular, some student unions are radically out of step with the average student and, um, you know, have adopted even uh, formally pro-choice policies and banned pro-life clubs and that sort of thing. And we can route around them by exercising our constitutional rights and public property, but um, they can come out and try to interfere with activism. And um, I don't want to say it's entirely a con, but I think it's something that we need to be strategically conscious of. Because first of all, we can reach some of them. I mean, um, my friend Katie once talked to a counter protester who was holding a sign at University of Toronto and after a 20 minute conversation, he put the sign down and, and, and left like he wasn't confident enough in counter protesting us anymore because she had made some headway with him. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in terms of our team, if we're, if we're smart about proactive strategy and making sure that we're being effective and reaching students, then um, it can be energizing to face off with counter protesters and treat them with love and respect, but do a better job at our activism than they're doing at theirs. It can be really motivating and energizing for the team. But if we are not smart about that, um, it can be a major con where like, you know, we don't want to bring a new volunteer. They're, you know, they're brand new, uh, their first time doing outreach to an environment where they're going to be surrounded by 10 counter protesters. So, um, that can be a con that we have to deal with sometimes an organized opposition, but we handle that by being strategic, you know? So when we have new members of the team, we get them started out on campuses um, that are just some of the 
best places to exercise the apologetics you've just learned to get comfortable in conversation. And once they're comfortable in conversation, we invite them to join us at campuses where there are counter protesters and they can be energized by the fact that they know the apologetics, that they can reach people even in spite of the opposition. So we have to be conscious of that. So it's kind of, it's kind of in the cons column, but not a deal breaker. I, I'm glad that you said it because that was the only one that really came to my mind as well. And, and like you said, it, there's kind of an asterisk beside the con anyways, because they can be so empowering, they can be so fruitful. And maybe if we can dive into this a little bit deeper, because I know that it's something that you've dealt with. I know that it, especially Mount Royal here in um, in Calgary, and I know that I've worked with groups at the University of Manitoba with our colleague Kyle and whatnot, that there can be a lot of these organized kind of counter protests. What goes through your mind as a leader and what should be going through the minds of the activists when they're engaging with potentially organized counter protesters? Because one big thing that comes to my mind is how do we navigate kind of a mob mentality? How do we mitigate the chances of this escalating into a unproductive encounter and how do we optimize the chances that it is productive and one thing I, and i'm curious on your take on this one thing that i've found really well is how do i get as many different activists into as small a conversation context as possible how do i get as mm -hmm. many people that i have at activism talking to as few people as possible because I, I, i'm sure that you've seen the the situation where you have a whole bunch of people around you and they're all shouting out different things and you're trying to manage the conversation flow and you're trying to get a breakthrough with any individual student and sometimes this looks like can i pick off one of these kind of organized counter protesters and have a meaningful conversation with them Sometimes I get to the point where I say, how many of these counter-protesters counter can I get talking to me so that all of my colleagues, all of the other volunteers that have come out to activism can talk to whether it's passersby or whether they can just pick off one activist at a time? Is that a similar approach that you often take when it comes to an organized counter-protest? How do I get the most number of pro-lifers talking to the fewest number of abortion advocates does that does that go through your mind or do you have a, a different strategy for responding to those organized protests so um some of that goes through my mind but I, I think about it in a bit of a different way um i think when it comes to conversations and i'll take the group conversations first um uh we definitely take a similar approach where um though, though I, th I think it's a discernment question right so um what we try and train our team at toronto against abortion to do um when there is, uh, you know, like if you see somebody who's in a group conversation, um, you know, step one, let's say, is to kind of listen in and see how it's going. Because sometimes group conversations can be fantastic when you have the opportunity for one person to have a productive conversation that like has an audience and more people get the message all at once. But if you notice that somebody's in a group conversation and it's not productive, say if there's two or more um uh, people who are, you know, interrupting or they keep switching the topic back and forth. And it's, um, it's less effective for the pro-life activist because, um, she can't address anything fully because she keeps getting interrupted with yet another objection before she can respond to any of them. Then what we do is, um, we try to step in and pick off some of those people to see if we can separate them in to other conversations. So simple example, if there are, you know, are two people that, keep trying to talk at the same time to the one pro-lifer, I'll step in and try and get one of them in a conversation with me so I can break that up, right? So we don't break up a group conversation if it's, if it's going well and it's great and there's an audience to a productive conversation, but if it's not productive, then absolutely we try to break it off. Um, uh, to your original question about, um, you know, uh, what to keep in mind about counter protests, I think the number one thing that we brief people on is that, um, I mean, counter protesters are both strategic obstacles and most often hurting and wounded human beings. So we need to keep in mind that, you know, what usually motivates someone to come out and counter protest the pro-life message is going to be some kind of personal connection with abortion or some kind of heart issue or emotional block. Um, it is extra important to treat the counter protesters with love and respect and to keep front of mind that they have, everyone has a story and they have a story that we haven't heard yet. And to be extra sensitive to that, especially while they're being strategic obstacles and trying to cover up the bodies of, of abortion victims and censor the pro-life message so that we can 
strategically and tactically respond to their obstruction while being sensitive to their wounds. Um, so uh, when it comes to like, like people often ask, like, should I talk to the counter protesters or is that a waste of time? Like I always say, you know, give it a shot and see how it goes. And if it's not productive, if someone's just trolling you, okay, well then you can spend your time elsewhere. But um, we've had lots of productive conversations with counter protesters. They're people too. They have their own experiences. They might have not have heard the pro-life message. So um, we just try and keep that perspective front of mind among all our team members. Um, another key thing that comes to mind um, in CCPRs and the Killing Plan and are thinking about strategy and how we bring about an abortion-free Canada, how we reach everybody with abortion victim photography and human rights apologetics. You know, one of the one of the steps to doing that as we work backwards from the goal is that we need to make abortion impossible to ignore. So some days, like when we were at U of T's clubs fair uh, this September, um, uh, and there were throngs and throngs of frosh leaders coming out to try and block abortion victim photography partway through our first uh, session of street outreach. Um, there is strategic benefit to... Um, let's say making a bit of a commotion and making abortion impossible to ignore. We know that, okay, today is not a day that we're gonna have conversations with everybody, but we can set a tone that, um, welcome to the University of Toronto, where you talk about all sorts of contentious issues and abortion is one of them. This is a live debate on campus. And then we follow up throughout the year to try and have conversations with those people. But um, to attract attention to the issue provides strategic benefit. And there might be some days where we're more focused on quality conversations and other days where we're more focused on um, having large views of the photos and uh, attracting attention to the abortion debate on campus. Um, but when it comes to counter protesters trying to block the photos, uh, that's the, uh, the, the main thing where ratios matter. So um, we reconfigured that day, you know, everyone was holding signs and having conversations. And as uh, the student union and frosh leaders came with cardboard to try and block the photos, we reconfigured tactically so that um, in each of our teams, one person was holding all the signs and keeping as many of them busy, busy as possible, while the rest of the team were floating around with pamphlets, having conversations as people walked by, like, what is going on over there? half our team could have conversations while as few as people as possible would keep the counter protesters occupied. And normally with the way that we configure signs, you know, at, at Toronto Metropolitan University, um, I, I will, uh, I'll be happy when I can keep 10 counter protesters busy myself, just one of me. Um, at U of T this month, we did a count and there was 30 to 40 of them surrounding one of us and another 30 surrounding another one. So we were keeping 65 to 70 of them busy with two of us while everyone else was having conversations about the abortion issue. So when we think strategically and tactically about what's our objective, normally we're showing the photos and having the conversations at the same time. When counter protesters present an obstacle to that, we divide and conquer. We split up the responsibilities. Okay, your job is to keep as many of them busy as possible and try and show the photos if you can. Well, your job is to go and have conversations based on people who are trying to wonder what's going on based on that, you know? So tactically, we reconfigure to route around the obstacles while keeping in mind that the counter protesters are people with their own wounds, uh, more likely to be wounded than not if they're that passionate and motivated to come out and block up the photos. And we need to treat them with respect and there could be an opportunity to reach them too, or at least some of them. 100%. And I think that speaks volumes to the strategic approach that we've taken at CCBR. For those of you who may be new in the audience, Pro-Life Guys podcast is a division, a appendage, whatever you want to call it, of the Canadian Centre for Bioethical Reform that has this two-pronged strategic approach of publicly exposing the visual reality of what abortion does to preborn children and coupling that with that compassionate, compelling, apologetic approach, engaging people in meaningful conversations. And like you said, making this... Um, an issue that cannot be ignored, an issue that is present to people on campus. And is not exactly the goal of every campus pro-life club, right? I'm, I'm sure that you can go beyond that and you can offer resources and support to people on, on campus who are pregnant, um, whether it's bursary support, whether it's other stuff. But I think that at, it, at our core, that is the goal of the pro-life movement, especially within that forum of the university campus, making this an, a topic that people are thinking about, that people are considering, 
And just to share a few stats here, Blaze, um, that I've shared on the podcast before, before we move into the second part of, of expectations for students and how students can get involved, um, keep in mind that, that obviously pro-life work is somewhat stressful regardless of what you're doing. If you've done pro-life work before, you're probably going to have to to work yourself up to do it, regardless of whether you're holding an image that shows what abortion does to a preborn child, whether you're holding a clipboard, whether you are handing out candies at a, a table. Pro-life work is somewhat stressful. And so uh, the what I'm often and, and our team at CSPR is often encouraging people to consider is the return on investment, right? The, the polling that we've done on abortion victim photography that shows that 67.3% of people polled were willing to admit that they felt more negatively about abortion after viewing an image than they had before. And coupling that with the conversational outcome statistics, I, I know that we've done um, a little bit differently here in Calgary than you guys have in Toronto, but, but based on around 2,500 conversations that we've tracked here in Calgary, we're seeing around one in four people become fully pro-life in the span of a conversation. Those conversations can be nerve wracking, they can be anxiety inducing, they can be challenging, they can be frustrating. One in four people, once you take the pro-life people out of that, we're close, to, we're, we're over one in three people, we're close to 40% of people are becoming fully pro-life by the end of a conversation um, and admitting so. And so if you're going to get um, stressed out by pro-life work, I want to invite you and encourage you and challenge you to do the most effective pro-life work that you can by coupling the very real, very profound and compelling imagery that shows the evidence as to how we know and why we know that abortion kills preborn children, coupled with the apologetics that we're trying to convey on this podcast and that people like you, Blaze, are um, equipping students with on a regular basis. Um, by way of pivot, I, I want to talk about, you mentioned that, that this is a great opportunity to engage pro-life students on campus because um, not only are there pro-life students on campus, sometimes they feel marginalized, sometimes they've never been involved in pro-life stuff before, maybe they have, and they get onto university campus and they're, they're overwhelmed by the pro-abortion kind of worldview of their classmates and peers and whatever else. And they're looking for an outlet and an opportunity, but also because they have time, like we talked about, they have time between classes and whatnot. What are your thoughts on students getting involved? How do they get involved? First of all, what, what is the first step for somebody who might be listening to this program or who might encounter one of our teams on a campus? What, do you, what would you suggest as a first step for them, both to have in the back of the minds of the activist, what should I be trying to get this pro-life student to do, and as the pro-life student? And then we'll dive into how they can integrate pro-life engagement into their um, kind of day-to-day -day life while a student on campus. But what are your thoughts on the first step for somebody getting involved in the pro-life movement once they've come in contact with a pro-life group, community, um, team, such as the ones that you and I are leading? Right. Well, I think, you know, the first step is to get someone connected to the community and trained and equipped to be able to do outreach. And, and, and that's everything in the, in the service of the goal, because as you were saying before, you know, the goal of the campus club is to um, <laughs> what we do when working with campus leaders from from our experience as being campus leaders. Um, you know, the, the, the leadership of TAA has come out of that U of T Students for Life activism. Um, we try to get them to realize, you know, a pro-life club is not a place to go and have pizza with people who are already pro-life. Um, the mission of a pro-life club is to go out and transform your campus, to transform your community, to transform your city, to transform your country. It's doing that local part to make abortion unthinkable. It's like, here's my community. I have a unique opportunity to reach them. And our mission as a team is to change hearts and minds on abortion, to save lives and spare women the trauma of abortion. So everything we do as a club needs to be in the service of the goal. So when we're meeting new people, we want to get them connected to the community of that club and train to do outreach because that's the most important thing that we do is to reach others. We educate ourselves so that we can educate others. The three things that we do in the sort of U of T Students for Life club model that we've uh, uh, you know, brought to, to other uh, Campus for Life clubs as well is um, activism, seminar, socials. Like outreach is the primary goal of the club. In order to do that, to educate the community, we need to educate ourselves. That's what the seminar is for. That's what we use our meetings for, is to learn more about the issues. You know, to talk about the same kind of things that you talk about on the podcast, right? To help us grow, to be effective ambassadors for preborn human rights. And then the social aspect, because, um, I mean, outreach can be tough. It can be tough to be pro-life on a campus. And that community aspect in the service of educating the broader community, like having that, that, that sense of team and cohesion and camaraderie is so important um, 
for, for providing support to other pro-lifers and, and, and for giving people the, the confidence and the motivation to do the sometimes hard work of going out and having those um, life-saving and life-changing conversations on campus. So we're trying to plug people into the activism seminars and socials. You know, step one is how, we can, how can we invite them to come to the next event that is scheduled on campus? And how can we offer them um, apologetics training so that they can participate fully in outreach? Those are the two key things that we're doing. And um, what's what I mentioned earlier, what you were saying is unique about campus. I mean, when we're reaching high school students, there are high school students who get involved, but they can't get involved at the same time that you're reaching high school students. They're, they'll be available on a weekend. You know, if we're talking to people downtown, we can meet a pro-lifer, but if they're on lunch at work, they're not going to volunteer on their lunch break at work. They might be able to volunteer on evenings or weekends. But when you're talking to a university student who has time to have a conversation with you on campus, that's also when they might have time to volunteer for outreach. So we've met a bunch of people on our team, like my friend Adam. We met him during street outreach at Ryerson University, and um, he became the president of Ryerson Against Abortion after being connected to community, being trained, being a part of our outreach team and growing into leadership roles. He did a summer internship with CCBR, you know, but we met him out of Choice Chain on campus, plugged him in through that first step, but um, there's such an opportunity to, uh, to get people connected and to recruit pro-lifers while you also change the minds of pro-choicers at the same time. Yeah, hundred percent. Some of our best volunteers, I think of Kent, um, who's now in the military, but but he, we met him at Mount Royal. He had kind of watched us talk to a bunch of counter protesters and came and approached us and was like, you know, you guys are what I've been looking for. Um, I feel like I'm the only pro life kid on campus. Like, like, what do I do? And to get him plugged in with our volunteer team, initially he wasn't super comfortable going out and doing activism on his own campus because he was a little bit nervous about what um, his his peers and classmates might say, but be able to plug him into meaningful pro-life outreach right from the get-go and get him growing in his confidence and competence in pro-life engagement. Everyone's going to have a different kind of internal calculus as to how comfortable they feel on their own campus versus other campuses. I know that you have at times taken students from one campus to another campus so that they can have that little bit of comfort on that end. Um, I, I'm sure there's a ton of different directions that we can go with that, but I'm curious about, uh, I, I love what you say about this being the means to an end, the end being outreach. That is the end of a pro-life group, that, that the socials, the trainings, the meetings, the whatever have to be a means to an end, getting people in that direction. And I feel like my my journey of what I, the volume of engagement of university students has become a little bit more nuanced than when I first got involved. Because when I first got involved, I was like, you should do everything all of the time. You should do all of the pro-life stuff all of the time, all of the everywhere. Your degree doesn't matter. D's get degrees. You learn that in second year university or whatever. And then I got into like the, the pendulum swung all the way to the other end of like, no, don't overcommit yourself. Don't do too much. Like when you're getting involved, just like gradually get your toe in. And I feel like I've kind of centered out into this kind of realm of the initial engagement stage is a high volume stage, getting that background information, training, comfort, doing activism. It's going to help you if you dive into it feet first and just get yourself immersed in the pro-life movement and then once you you have your feet under you being able to kind of pick and choose how you um kind of schedule your involvement whether that looks like volunteering every day every week a couple times a semester whatever that looks like i'm curious your thoughts on that idea of taking the plunge early so that you get a lot of that initial training so that your, your competency level goes up really quickly. And once you, you have gotten to a, a suitable stage of competency and confidence, then obviously, I, and this isn't saying that, that you need to read every pro-life book in the world. I, I know that I'm rambling now, Blaze, but I, I'm curious on your thought as to how a new student could approach the, the investment stage, the outcome stage, and balancing pro-life work with the rest of what they have going on in their life, I guess. That's super interesting. I've never actually thought about it in terms of that initial stage, stage and initial phase. I think there's a lot of wisdom and insight in the way that you put it. Uh, but my mind also goes to the fact that um, that was not my experience at all. Now, it might have been better if it was. And, and the thing is, when I was an undergrad, we were doing annual activism with abortion victim photography because we didn't have the tools to do regular activism. It, it was you know, set up at, a, at the Abortion Awareness Project for a whole day, right? 
Um, so it, maybe I could have got more involved earlier if I had the opportunity to do that kind of high volume intensity. But for me, it was like a gradual over years getting more and more involved until suddenly I'm Eastern Outreach Director for CCBR. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, like, I, like I, 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 was, I was very slow and incremental in getting involved. And I had a lot of other commitments and a lot of other responsibilities. So, uh, but, but, but what you say, I think it has a lot of wisdom because I think the people in general who I've seen get most effectively involved and equipped go through that kind of higher intensity or high volume stage, you know, whether it's, um, whether it's through volunteering and campus activism as a student, or whether it's coming to like the summer crash course that we run in, in Toronto or, or, or going to the Florida abortion awareness project trip, like, like some kind of, you know, intensive where, um, you can really, uh, you know, get comfortable, like learn how to ride the bike. Um, you know, through a higher volume, uh, you know, a flurry of conversations, like that there's real value in that for learning possible too. For me, it always comes down to, um, to a balance, calibrating a balance around sustainability, because on the one hand, babies are dying. This is the leading cause of death. This is an urgent issue. And we need people to give their time and energy and put it towards um, speaking out and being a voice for preborn children who can't speak for themselves. This is, um, you know, the, the I, I think, the most important human rights issue and certainly has the highest death toll um, of any injustice going on now. Um, on the other hand, it is not necessarily realistic or sustainable for everyone to just drop everything and devote every waking hour to the movement. I mean, people have families. Um, I did two degrees. Like I, I chipped away at a master's part-time while I was taking on more and more leadership roles in the pro-life movement. And I think there is, um, like, I guess, like language that we centered on at U of T Students for Life um, five to seven years back was, because um, Students for Life also would volunteer at Aid to Women, uh, uh, the local crisis pregnancy center in downtown Toronto, and was, you know, but, but outreach with Toronto Against Abortion was the primary thing. And the language we centered on was to say, you know, um, the outreach that we do, activism, it isn't the only thing that we do, but it is the most important thing that we do, right? And I think that what's true for the club can be true for individual students, right? I think that, um, you know, pro-life activism, especially if you have responsibilities as a student, it's not going to be the only thing that you're doing, you know, and, and, you know, if you have a family or a boyfriend, a girlfriend or something, it's not gonna be the only thing that you're doing with your life, but it, it's one of the most important things that you can do with your life. So it's, how do you balance that? And, 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 and that's the kind of guiding principle because it's different for different people. You know, some people have to pay to put themselves through university and they're putting in hours at a job in addition to studying and they might have less time or availability than someone who's got like a light course load and their, their tuition funding is secured already. Um, you know, some people might be in a Christianity and culture program that might have some other pro-lifers in the class, whereas somebody else might be in women's studies or might be like, uh, you know, where it's really hostile or they might be uh, hostile to the pro-life view, or they might be in law school or medical school and feel a need to keep their head down. Um, to a certain extent. And I think there's different balancing acts that different people do. You know, there's advantage to having uh, to, uh, to having pro-life doctors and lawyers. Um, you know, as, as you mentioned, some people might have hesitations about doing activism on their own campus. Um, that, that, that guiding principle of like, it's one of the most important things you can do. Like we always encourage people to do activism on their own campus. I did activism on my campus um, while I was a student at U of T all the way throughout. Um, but we don't pressure people and we give them other opportunities. You know, some people are more, I mean, we work in partnership with clubs like TAA is a partnership to Toronto against abortion. It's a partnership with the campus pro love pro life clubs in the GTA. Um, so we all volunteer at each other's campuses and help grow activism all throughout the city. That also gives opportunities. Um, you know, we had a lot of U of T students who would do activism at Ryerson and help, uh, a new team get going because they got a bunch of experience at U of T and they could bring that to Ryerson. We've also had, say, some Ryerson students who was like, you know what, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable doing campus uh, activism on my campus yet, but I'll come and volunteer at U of T and I'll get comfortable there and then I'll consider if I would do activism at my own campus, right? And giving people opportunities and options 
impressing upon them that pro-life outreach is one of the most important things they can do. And it's critical that we have people putting their time and energy to it, but that we need to be prudent in that balancing act. And another way of phrasing that guiding principle is it's about sustainability, right? We need to do as much as we can, but we don't want to do so much that we burn out. Um, so it's about how much can we sustainably do to put our time and energy towards this critical, urgent priority. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how do we optimize the entire team dynamic to get as many boots on the ground as possible? I, I think often I, I think I was actually talking to our colleague Kateri, who's based in, in Vancouver, and she was talking about a volunteer that, um, because of variety of factors, was very, very passionate about helping, but very much not in position to have a sign. And she was asking, how do I get involved? How do I help? And Kateri and I kind of talked through the value of having that person on camera. But at that, at, at that moment in that person's life, they, they were not in the position to be able to hold a sign. And so how do we best optimize that person's involvement? Because she had the, the absolute passion to get involved. Just a matter of how do we figure out a way to optimize the effectiveness of this team? And she was more than happy to come out and, and do the security camera, get the, the training from Kateri on how to effectively ensure that, that all of the different activists are out there being safe. How do we find a way, if, if we have at our core, like you've mentioned, um, the most important, most essential thing in this current moment is to expose the reality of abortion and engage people in conversations about it. We need that educational component more than anything right now. How do we optimize our efforts to get as many people doing that as well as we possibly can? And if you've got people who aren't available during the evening, but maybe they can give some of those seminars to help put other boots on the ground. If you've got people who can do the background work to get more boots on the ground, it's not a matter of placing them i i want to say this delicately and i invite you blaze to, to correct me if i if i don't strike the right balance on this but um it's not a matter of placing all of the roles as equal because you don't want 12 people who are all a little bit intimidated all volunteering to jump on camera that you want to impress upon everybody just how essential it is to have that message those signs those conversations happening but understanding that that balance is going to look different for different people, their availability, their comfort, their skill set, um, their other responsibilities, and how do you best optimize that team? And how do you help people realize that where they're fitting in on a current day or within the scope of a, a semester is facilitating that? That, you know what, today I want to help you. Um, we, we really want to help get this new volunteer X up up to speed and so he's going to pair up with me and volunteer why i'm going to ask you to go on camera not because i don't think that you could do a good job on on the sign but because i need to help this other person grow in their comfort or whatever how do we best optimize the team dynamic and the most boots on the ground doing the most effective work possible is that fair to say or, or would you would you adjust that a little bit blaze no I, I i agree with everything you say and i think you articulated well i would i would add you know it's um it's normalizing full participation and outreach that's what's needed and i and i think that that you know um that that can be what's um what's expected as a default there's 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 so many people who think i mean i think of my friend luke from ryerson who um he he met us actually via via social media when there was uh when there was an incident and like an unusually bad incident at ryerson and we went to the to the media in terms of like this is what's happened it needs to stop in order to to seek justice and he was like well God bless you guys for the work that you do. I could never do that. And I invited them out to join Ryerson Against Abortion, at least come out to the meetings. I connect them to the community. And he became a regular volunteer at Outreach, right? So there's, there's a lot of people who, who might think they can't do Outreach. And I've seen so many people become fantastic at it, right? So it's normalizing Outreach. Um, and it's not creating jobs for the sake of jobs that are like take you off the, the, the core mission. But, you know, having somebody on camera is key to making outreach happen. So if somebody's in a particular position where, you know, for whatever reason, um, they aren't able to have conversations or hold a sign now, it can still enable the outreach to happen if they fill that camera role. Or, you know, um, I could think of a, a friend at, at the University of Toronto where he was at a place where um, there was a reason where he wasn't able to join the outreach team, but he was able to provide some aerial support by writing for the blog and helping out in a way that wasn't like, you know, totally off topic, but like, okay, how can I produce some other resources that help build community, that help educate the team and help reinforce the work that we're doing, trying to, 
you know, get everyone out doing outreach, right? So it's, it's not inventing new jobs or being distracted from the mission, but it's recognizing, even if it's not the default or the usual situation, that um, is there something that someone can do that can still contribute to the core mission that doesn't take us off pack, uh, path, but um, supports that central work that we're doing. And um, when you talk about different people getting involved, it reminds me, you know, the, the first few years um, that TAA was really growing when it grew beyond the University of Toronto, when we expanded across the city, partnered with other campus clubs, and we kind of grew to, um, to doing about 200 hours of street activism uh, per year across the city and, and vast majority of that on campuses and fall semester was always the busiest time. And for a couple of years in a row, I ran the numbers. Um, I guess we had grown enough that we were doing a bunch of activism, but not enough such that I was still there almost every time. Uh, it's hard for me to do it now because we have so many other team leaders in the city, but, um, because I had been there, like I had a strong sense of like every single volunteer who had been out and I ran the numbers, you know, and I was like, you know, for this fall, you know, for this, you know, for these like 40 or 50 hours of outreach that we've done, um, we've had about 30 volunteers who made that happen. And about 10, 10 to 15 of them were coming out once, maybe even twice a week. Now, about 10 to 15, uh, uh, sorry, sorry uh, about, about 10, like, like, let's round for easy numbers, about 10, you know, once or even twice a week. Another 10 were coming out a couple times a month, and then another 10 showed up maybe once or twice, right? And the thing is, we needed every one of those people to make outreach happen. There was a whole bunch of times where we had just enough people in order for that outreach session to happen rather than having to cancel. So we needed those regular volunteers as the anchor, as the core for the team. But, you know, I, I try to impress upon people, like, you know, so, sometimes somebody shows up and like, they haven't been for a couple months and they come out once. I was like, hey, you know what? I almost canceled outreach today, but because you were able to make it today, we're able to make it happen. And, you know, if you can't make it every week or even every month, no worries. But every time you come makes a difference. And it's that combination of people um, all contributing at whatever level they're able to that makes it possible for us to go out there and change hearts and minds on abortion. Absolutely. We often talk to our Calgary volunteers out here about not just volume, but proportionality as well. That, that absolutely, I will take people coming out multiple times per week, no questions asked, love it. Come out as frequently as you can and proportionally as well. If you could come out three times a week and you only come out one time a week, how can we make it easier for you to come out three times a week? How can we help you optimize and, and increase the proportional time that you come out based on how many times you could come out? If, if you can only come out once a semester or once a month or whatever, and every time you could come out, you do come out, then, then we're, doing, we're doing our job. Our job is to optimize the number of times you come out based on how often you could come out. And so certainly volume is great. And, and it's not a matter of the person who can only come out once a month and does come out once a month is a better volunteer than the person who could come out 10 times a week and only comes out five times a week. It's not just one or the other, but volume and proportionality are both things that we want our volunteers to be aware of that make sure this is sustainable, don't skip all of your classes and just, just do choice chain at eight hours a day every day because you're probably going insane doing it that way, especially because your your counter protesters will be there after 45 minutes or an hour and you're probably going to be um, having those conversations for an overwhelming majority of your time. Like, like, how do you optimize your effectiveness by both volume and proportionality coming out? And how can you, to kind of circle back, how can you help grow the team as well and maybe this is a note that we can all end on. I know that we've touched on it several times in this conversation already, Blaze, but this isn't just about talking to abortion advocates. It's about uh, multiplying our efforts by recruiting and engaging these pro-lifers. And I really want to have this as a big takeaway for anybody who's on campus, whether as a student or as an activist, that like you just mentioned, going from low-level activism on one campus to higher-level activism on one campus to low-level activism on lots of campuses to high-level activism on lots of campuses, that doesn't happen just by you doing more and more and more hours, right? That happens by having more and more people come into the fold, get involved, get trained, get 
experienced and get motivated to do as much as they possibly can. And so I, that's kind of one, one kind of final takeaway, I suppose, from me from this episode, that this is about effective activism and mobilizing as many people as possible. I'm sure that we can talk lots about the, the apologetics and whatnot that we focus on so regularly. But I guess one big thing that I just want everyone to take away is let's have good conversations with those who support abortion, but let's not miss on conversations that we have with people who don't support abortion. Let's find ways to get them involved and active right away so that our efforts can grow. It's not just a a replacement model. It's not just a matter of as soon as I can find somebody to do activism on Fridays and I don't have to do activism on Fridays anymore, but rather if I can find more and more people to do activism on Fridays, then maybe I can start a new team that's doing activism on Wednesday. Or maybe I can start a new team that's doing activism on Friday in a different location or something like that. How do we increase our numbers? Because now is go time, right? I mean, all things considered, since I think about everything that's happened since the last Uh, I won't even go to the last in-person semester because I don't know what campuses have done all the way through COVID. And obviously this semester will be a a bit of a a restart for for some campuses. But think about like Roe v. Wade got overturned in, in June, right? This is the first full semester since Roe v. Wade has been overturned. This has probably been percolating on a lot of people's minds through the summer months. This is a good opportunity to get involved. This is a good opportunity with more and more conversation happening around abortion, whether it's on a political level, whether it's attacks against um, Christ Pregnancy Care Centers, whatever it may be, abortion is in the air as a conversational topic. Let's strike while the iron's hot. Let's get people thinking about this more and more right now. Let's make sure that we've got pro-lifers um, getting involved. I know that was a long ramble by me, <laughs> Blaze, but any, any final kind of departing thoughts on what you really want to impress upon a pro-life activist going onto a campus, I guess? Yeah, well, I mean, plus one to everything that you just said there. Um, I I think one thing that I I would add is um, as you're talking about multiplying the team and multiplying the efforts, one of the the, the key things that that we learned in a UTSFL context, uh, UFT Students for Life, is, um, you know, once you have somebody connected to the team, it's also, um, you know, kind of giving them those leadership opportunities and thinking in advance about, about leadership transition and growing the team and, you know, one simple move that we made was just when we see, um, you know, committed volunteers with leadership potential, um, even before they would take on leadership roles with the club, we just, you know, invite them to come to an exec meeting or something like that and sort of see how it works a little bit or, you know, start um, inviting people who show that in, that interest and that potential um, to even just kind of like tag along for some of those things. And, and, um, uh, and, 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 you know, to, to, to say like, Hey, you have a lot of potential, I think, to like be a, a team leader. Like, would you would you want to like learn how to team lead and assistant lead with me for a while, and then, um, you know, maybe we could start adding some more street outreach if you're able to lead it on your own after after a bit, right? But but to think about investing in the people on our team to be able to um, to grow that team as well. So it's both recruiting new people and you know integrating them and getting them comfortable and getting them active, but then also thinking about um, about the potential of every member on the team and, you know, people who might be well suited for, for certain leadership roles of one type or another, and, you know, encouraging and fostering that development. So, um, so we're replacing people as they graduate, but so that we're also growing beyond that. So it's not just the same size, but it's growing the team to do more and more because there are so many more Canadians who need to be reached with the truth about abortion and so many more pro-lifers who can be equipped in order to make that a reality. Boom. Blaze Lane, the man, the man, the myth, the legend, folks. Thank you a ton, sir, for, for joining. I'm sure that we can tap this wisdom even further. And who knows? Spoiler alert, maybe, maybe we'll see Blaze a little bit more often. He threw out that offer to be part of the, the pro-life guys team. <laughs> that was a so joke. That was you, a joke. you might just see yourself um, <laughs> with with Blaze Lane a little bit more often on the show, folks. If if all goes well, and count yourself lucky if you get to hear more from Blaze Lane. Thanks a ton, my friend, for for coming in here. And I will see you in Calgary and like two weeks here pretty soon for for a staff retreat and planning and strategy thanks so much for having me back it was great i learned a lot talking to you too thanks for having me thanks a ton folks for tuning in that was my conversation with blaze elaine he is a champ um he is an excellent friend he is an excellent leader within canada's pro-life movement um and he has been a tremendous architect of the campus network throughout southwest on 
southwest Ontario and throughout much of the rest of Canada as well, with his fingers involved in equipping, mentoring, and leading pro-life activism on campuses, college, university, and otherwise. Um, throughout Ontario, across the country, He's fantastic. Check out the other episodes I've done with Blaze as well. We've talked to him about the theory of change, how the pro-life movement can work from our end goal of making abortion unpracticed and unthinkable back to where we are today. We've had him on for several other episodes as well, including a debate review, I believe, between Stephanie Gray Connors and um, Dr. Peter Singer. Um, he's a champ. He's got a ton of great content out there. Um, if you're in the Toronto area, hit me up um, and I'll get you plugged in with Blaze Elaine and the outreach that he is doing. And with that, I bid you farewell. I thank you for tuning in. If you're new to the program, please do check out our other content. Help us put more boots on the ground by checking out our Patreon. Go to our website, ProLifeGuys.com. All that fun stuff. Stay tuned for more cool episodes coming out um, and coming down the chute shortly. Thanks a ton. God bless you abundantly wherever you're at and however many hours in the day there are left wherever you are.